Okay. Good afternoon. Um, it is truly a pleasure to see that we have such a multinational following with a substantial Indian presence, which is always a pleasure. It's great to see so many friends again and would like to welcome you all as I would like to welcome Dr. Emma Flat, Dr. Evrim Binbas, and of course, the, uh, the organizers of, the, of these webinars, uh, Her Highness and uh, Vivek Gupta. Um, I can't welcome myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, today's discussion will focus on Emma Flat's fascinating and meticulously researched book. Emma Flat is an associate professor of history at the University of North, of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a visiting associate professor at NUC with a joint appointment in the South Asia Studies Program and the History of Department and the History Department. She has a PhD in history from the School of Oriental and African Studies, um, and, and her work focuses on the social and cultural history of early modern India. In 2019, she published the courts of the Deccan Sultanates living well in the Persian cosmopolis, a pioneer, pioneering work on the cultural sciences of the elites and peripatetic courtiers of the Deccan and their rulers from the late 14th century onwards. Her research on the cultural history of the Deccan focuses on the Persian cosmopolises that border the Sanskrit and where she explores the cultural space of the former located at the intersection of vernacular traditions. Her explorations of themes little researched up to now opened unexpected perspectives. She stresses the importance of knowledge for success, sociability, and friendship, and effectively argues that the Persian cosmopolis was a world of shared courtly values and skills, manners, and a wide range of interests from language, philosophy, to poetry, mathematics, astrology, magic, medicine to mention a few and these and to these techniques and objects pertaining to architectural forms perfumes and unguents were, uh, were important contributors. the latter accessible thanks to the international trading activities of educated and well-traveled merchants it is this distinctive cultural environment of sultan and Deccan that the lectures and webinars organized by the heritage of the Deccan heritage foundation in collaboration with the Foundation of Her Highness Sri Kandadatta Narasim Haraja Wadiyar of Mysore and the Center for Islamic Studies, Cambridge University, tried to investigate through their manifold expressions during our meetings. Before I ask Dr. Flat to discuss her work, let me introduce our discussants. I'm happy that Dr. Evrim Binbas, whose book on the intellectual networks of Timur Iran is amongst the most important contributions to our understanding of the political, religious, and cultural milieu of the 15th century is, um, is able to participate. He was uh, for seven years at the, he finished, um, he received his PhD from the University of Chicago. He was at, he was at, the, um, uni at the Royal Holloway University of London for a number of years. And then he moved to the Institute uh, of Oriental and Asian Studies at the University of Bonn. He studies early modern Islamic history with a particular focus on the Timurid and Turkmen dynasties of the 15th century. It is unfortunate that Dr. Subadayal could not participate in today's discussion for personal reasons. The last, this last minute's change prompt, prompted Dr. Vivek Gupta and myself, Helen Filon, to step in. Dr. Vivek Gupta is postdoctoral associate in Islamic art at the Center of Islamic Studies at the University of Cambridge, where he is also affiliated with Jesus College. He completed his PhD at SOAS, University of London, with a thesis entitled Wonder Reoriented, Manuscripts and Experience in Islamic Societies of South Asia. I am an architectural historian, the co-founder of the Deccan Heritage Foundation in the UK, India, and the USA. I completed my PhD at the School of Oriental and African Studies University of London with a thesis on the religious and royal architecture of the early Bahmanis of the Deccan. My work focuses on the architecture of the Bahmanis, whose varied architectural forms and landscapes help us understand their value systems as, as, as they are the only, they're amongst the few historical, as historical documentation is rather scarce 
and in many ways their monuments and landscapes uh, help us to better understand um, their concepts. Finally, let me thank Neil Cunningham from Cambridge University and our Indian team, and especially Sri Karadatatreya, for their help and continued support. Uh, so uh, I would also like, uh, I would now like to ask uh, Emma to take over and uh, start um, discussing her work. Thank you. Okay. I think, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. I'm just going to share my screen. So just one, there was one second. Was it not? Okay. I'm not able to share. It's really strange. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for coming uh, at whatever time it is in the world where you are. It's about nine o'clock in the evening where I am in Singapore. Um, and I hope everyone's been keeping safe and well despite these dark times in which we find ourselves. So I want to start, obviously, by saying thank you very, very much to the Deccan Heritage Foundation, um, to Vivek and to Helen, to Her Royal Highness, and also to the Center for Islamic Studies in Cambridge. Thank you all for hosting this amazing series of talks and for letting me be part of it. It's a real honor to be here. Um, so I, having not done very many of these book talks, I wasn't really sure how to describe my book in 20 minutes. So what I thought I would do is kind of construct a dialogue with myself, um, asking the questions that I imagine somebody who knew nothing about my book might want to know. So I'll kind of uh, talk to myself and hopefully it will cover the main things that might be important to know. So how did I end up working on this topic? Well, before I uh, came to became an academic, I actually spent some time in Anagundi, uh, the mother city, uh, so-called mother city of the Vijayanagar Empire. And while I was there, I was teaching English to young people who wanted to act as tour guides um, for tourists who were coming to uh, visit the ruins uh, at Hampi. And one of the things that kept coming up again and again and again was this uh, persisting uh, kind of rhetoric uh, this persistence um, of the idea of Vijayanagar as a Hindu bulwark against uh, Muslim sultanates and the eventual inevitable violent Muslim conquest. And no matter how much uh, uh, sort of contrary evidence was presented to them, even sometimes in their own lives, um, we couldn't get past this focus on the, this conflictual relationship um, that was basically religious in character as far as these uh, young people were co concerned. And of course, this is an extremely popular um, uh, trope, this idea of uh, Vijayanagar as a Hindu bulwark against uh, Muslim sultanates. In fact, it dates from Robert Sewell's A Forgotten Empire, um, which was published in 1900. And it was a particularly... Um, uh, it has been a particularly enduring uh, trope. So my I, idea decided eventually to become an academic was that I wanted to move, not so much exactly even go into the business of challenging this, this idea, but just to move away from this overweening focus on religion. So the, the idea that um, there, was, there are other things we can talk about in Deccani history, apart from merely focusing on religion and the extent to which there has been uh, communal hatred. So as a way of kind of, let's move the conversation on to see what else we can, we can find. So when I started uh, the research that led to this book, there had been a very long standing tradition of uh, flourishing art and architectural history. And in fact, that's a tradition that continues to flourish. Um, I've just put up a few recent books up on the slide here. And 
what I find is uh, what, of course, I'm not an art historian, I'm a textualist, and I wanted to again look at something slightly different from the visual record. At that stage, and this was in 2004, so before Richard Eaton's Social History of the Deccan came out, the most recent political and social history of the Deccan um, was, were the books of H.K. Shirwani, which many of you may be familiar with, which were written between the 1940s and the 1960s. So my idea was to write a thicker history, a thicker socio-cultural history of an area that at the time was very much overshadowed in people's minds and in historiography, by the Mughal Empire. So now you may ask, well, why courts? What is the point of learning about courts or writing about courts? There's something strange has happened to my PowerPoint, so please ignore this rather strange map. But uh, it was intended to show you the, uh, the major sites of the Persian cosmopolis um, between uh, 1400 and 1600. Now, unlike uh, European historiography, where courts and courtly culture have long been a serious topic of investigation, South Asian historiography, until the groundbreaking work of Daoud Ali, has shown little interest in investigating court societies, preferring to focus on the figure of the king or on practices of state building. Persistent Orientalist stereotypes have meant uh, that the cultural products of courts have often been dismissed as frivolous, superficial, opulent practices of degenerate rulers. And indeed, since the colonial period have been often invoked as a rationale for the decline of a once flourishing kingdom. And yet, I would argue, in a pre-modern sultanate, the practices of the courtly society were political. The performance of particular skills to the highest piece of peak of perfection was an opportunity to gain the attention of a powerful patron and thus access to a network of people and of opportunities for advancement. Now, okay, so courts we have, but why the Deccan? Now, the thing that intrigued me particularly about the Deccan and the Deccan courts was that they were populated by peoples of very diverse origins, not only Indians from the local area, as well as North Indians, but also Africans, uh, people from the Iranian plateau, uh, from what we now, the area we nowadays know as Iraq, people from Central Asia, as well as Arabs, who had traveled to the region in search of employment. And I wanted to investigate initially how origins, individuals of diverse origin managed to find work and success in such a different environment. What skills or education did they need? How did they support themselves financially and move vast distances? What networks of associates could they draw upon to travel and settle far from home? And what structured the courtly societies of the Deccan? And this is an image I've taken from uh, a page on the Chester Beatty's um, manuscript, the Nujum Ulalum, which is one of, it's the image on the front page of my book, uh, the front cover of my book rather, and it's, uh, well, the nearest image I could get to a Deccany court, um, the king and his courtiers surrounding him in this particular image. So what is the main argument of the book? So basically, I argue that Deccany society was structured by an understanding of courtliness that had evolved and was broadly shared across the area known as the Persian cosmopolis. I suggest that this understanding was acquired through a cosmopolitan education based on a widely agreed canon of texts, both literary and scientific, whose importance was recognized across the Persian cosmopolis. And as a result, we see the persistent circulation and quotation of certain classic texts in the Deccan, uh, things like the Shalnome, the Gulistan, the Poems of Muslami, and so on. And we also see the similarity of the themes that you find in those books and much of the content being recycled in a wide genre of works produced in the Deccan. But the point that, it, it, that seemed uh, most important to me, really, is that the aim of this initial education was not to acquire a particular body of knowledge but rather the aim of reading all of these different texts was to foster the formation of a specific type of disposition within each individual, a, disp a disposition which I describe as a courtly disposition. And what I mean by that is that one would uh, develop a particular attitude, a particular orientation towards the court society, um, 
sort of that we could summarize briefly by saying the ideal of serving the sultan and a particular attitude and orientation towards the self, an attitude of st striving to perfect oneself. So what this meant was this courtly disposition meant that an individual could subsequently acquire and use specific skills valued at court, such as poetry, letter writing, perfume making, or sword fighting in their daily life to help negotiate the faction filled dynamic world of Persian courts. But at the very same time, courtliness was considered an ethical practice. So underlying the key texts of this cosmopolitan education, was a widely shared medico-philosophical understanding of the connections between mind, body, and soul, or body, mind, and soul, and the way in which the perfection of one presupposed the engagement of the others. And drawing, and I, I, I'm skimming over the philosophical background to this, but drawing from this philosophical background, you get the idea then that disciplined, repetitive physical and mental movements um, that were required to perfect the acquisition of a, a particular skill. And I've given you the example here of um, this. These were exercises recommended for wrestlers and sword fighters. Um, these kind of disciplined uh, repeti repetitive exercises became a form also not only perfecting one's skill, but perfecting one's own body and therefore by extension, working to, towards the perfection of one's soul. So basically what I'm trying to say is that there's, there's this wide, uh, widely shared understanding of this analogy between the physical body of the, um, the doer of the skill and the interior stuff, uh, we can refer to it, although the terms are not precise as the mind or the soul or the heart, um, that means the things that are done by the body as a daily practice in acquiring a skill are at the same time refining the soul. So what does this mean exactly? Well, in the second half of my book, I discuss three different types of skill. Epistolary, um, or letter writing, and here I look at the manuals of Insha, uh, written by the Bahmani Vizier Mahmoud Gavan. I look at esoteric skills, um, by which I mean astrology, magic, and talismans. Um, and I look at an astrological compendium, the Najum Ululun, written by the Bijapuri Sultan, Ali Adil Shah, in 1570. And thirdly, I look at martial skills, wrestling and sword fighting. And here, I didn't find a single text that focused on it, um, although I found fragments uh, in this uh, uh, in strangely titled Nihang Nama, um, uh, this uh, fragments of text that exist uh, in, in very, very fragmentary form, the mainly pictures was just a few scraps of text on the back. Um, so I had to rely on historical chronicles and a contemporary uh, Timurid text, um, several contemporary Timurid texts on Javon Mordi, or young manliness. Um, so I looked at these three different skills. And I investigate how a courtier could use each skill to achieve worldly success at court. For example, by composing a technically perfect and highly persuasive letter in the ornate style of Insha to effect an alliance with a rival or to chastise a recalcitrant, recalcitrant inferior, for example. Or um, by uh, avoiding inauspicious celestial influences in the construction of objects that were expected to be used by the king. Here we have an example of the Durka Chakram, which is an astrological chart found in the Nujum Ululum um, that is designed to plot out the celestial influences on the royal palanquin. Um, another way in which you could, uh, you could use the, the skill of astrology would be predicting victory or defeat in battle. And the Kuram Chakram, this is uh, the universe or the known world, India mainly, uh, envisaged on the back of a tortoise. And each of these little segments corresponds not only to a direction, but also to specific positions, uh, specific regional places within um, the, the traditional map of India. Um, or again, a third way in which you could uh, in which a courtier could use what the skills would be um, to demonstrate a, or vanquish rather an arrogant visiting wrestler who is casting aspersions on the strengths of your sultan's fighters. 
But in the, each chapter, I also demonstrate that the process of acquiring each of these skills involved a disciplined re repetition of specific bodily practices. And in the technical literature devoted to each skill, undertaking such practices and perfecting the performance of them was understood to endow the actor with unusual, perhaps we could even say magical or supernatural powers, um, which would allow him to mold his own soul and even to alter the shape of not only the mundane world, but of the cosmos too. So a particularly beautifully co composed letter could transform not only the emotional and physical state of the writer, but that of the recipient too. Undertaking the bodily austerities required to summon a planetary spirit or the angels or a jinn. And here we have uh, an, an image of somebody summoning the planet Saturn. Um, would endow the master of invocations, as that individual would be called, with peculiar bodily powers, uh, such as the ability to smell beautiful smells or the ability to sing in a voice sweeter than the prophet David or the ability to chat with the prophet Muhammad. Um, so it would endow this master of invocation with these peculiar bodily powers, as well as proximity to the desired spirit. And of course, training one's body in wrestling or sword fighting, uh, these images are from the Nihang Nama, um, was understood to simultaneously impart ethical training to the soul, akin to the ethical training offered by following the Sufi Parikka. You might wonder at this point, well, how did the local environment fit in? Um, and I should be very, very clear that by arguing for a broad acceptance of a certain type of cosmopolitan education across the Persian cosmopolis, um, and in particular in the Deccan, I'm not in any way trying to suggest that the Deccan was entirely or even predominantly a Persian space. In order to succeed at any particular court, Powerful local political imperatives required a significant engagement with the vernacular environment in terms of language, culture, and cosmology. The courtly disposition that was imparted by the cosmopolitan education did not demand a narrow culturally or linguistically specific set of requirements, but allowed the acquisition of any relevant skill or body of knowledge. The understanding of a continuum between objects, body, and self, the idea of uh, a porous self, if you like, made sense in Indic medical traditions like Ayurveda, where the environment and everything with, that the body is surrounded with is thought to influence uh, the health of the body. And so many of the writers of the technical manuals produced in the Deccan engaged with the local environment, whether through the use of local ingredients and aesthetic ideas of rasa in perfume manuals, or through emphasizing an underlying unity of existence despite the polyphony of languages in a letter writing manual, or most strikingly through the conceptual translations of Ali Adil Shah's astrological encyclopedia, the Nujumul Ilum, where both the author and the illustrators strove for conceptual, uh, conceptual commensurabilities between Indic and Persian traditions. And so just a couple of images to explain, or slides to explain what I mean there. Throughout the Nujumul Ilum, we find these moments in which uh, to diverse knowledge systems are being translated and made equivalent one to the other um, for the benefit of the reader. And so, for example, in a description of the astrolo uh, astrological chart uh, intended to be um, plotted if you are making a, a royal umbrella, we find these series of equivalences in, of courtly terminology. So His Majesty the Pacha, Alampana, the protector of the world, the Pacha versus Alampana. The Santraki, meaning the queen or Rani of the Pacha, who has the title Malika Jahan, the Vazir Hukumat, the Vazir of the Kingdom, and the Siri Nubat. So these are the various different people who can carry, who will be affected if the planets fall on different parts of the umbrella. But what I find interesting is the way in which these particular people are described in terms both in Indic terms as well as Persian terms. And there is a constant effort to make this equivalent. The Raj Lok, meaning those who are in the gathering, Majlis, and the presence, Huzuri, and get honor from seeing the Pacha. So here we have a, a sense of both an, an Indic court and um, an, a Persian court. And this happens similarly um, 
when we get, and, and most strikingly, when we see the description of the planets. And the, at the very beginning of the Nujum, the planets are described in very, very great detail, first in a very astronomical way, um, with measurements and details of orbits and so on, and then a much more anthropological way, um, in which uh, each planet is described in terms of its genealogy, and then uh, given a, a whole list of associations are given between a planet and the particular regions and countries and objects that are associated with that planet. So here we have a description of the planet Pared or Mercury. Um, we have the description of where his um, his father, um, who his father is, his mother is Ruhini Nakshatar, meaning Dabaran, uh, and among regions and countries, the region of Kasi is related to him, which in the terminology of Sanskrit they called Matura. Among Nadiha, meaning rivers, Sasati is related to him. So when we have this, these phrases, we have Nadiha meaning rivers. The first is uh, usually an Indic term and the second is often a, a Persian term. But the order changes, which suggests that the person writing and reading this isn't necessarily a stable uh, figure. It's not necessarily just a Persian speaker who doesn't know Indic words. Sometimes the Persian words are explained um, to an perhaps an Indic speaker or a speaker of an Indian language. We see this also not only in the writing, but also in the particular description, the, the particular illustrations that were commissioned. So if you look at the previous slide, um, you can see that uh, Utarad, although he is described in terms that make him sound extremely Indic, um, in the, uh, the depiction of him, the visual depiction of him, he very much resembles nothing more than uh, an old man or mullah uh, reading his book. So much more of an, a Persianate kind of image. Here we have Venus um, uh, on the left-hand side and Mars on the right-hand side. And Venus is um, actually depicted in a highly unusual way in this, uh, this iconography. I don't think there's an, another, it must be a very local iconography because it doesn't correspond to either the familiar Indic iconography of Venus or the uh, Islamic and Persian if I can. And similarly, you have uh, Mars uh, looking quite Persian with his Rustum like helmet, but slightly Indic with his four different arms holding the different weapons. So the point I'm trying to get across is that there is a constant engagement, uh, most strikingly, most obviously in this text, but if we look for it, we can find it in many of the different texts that were written. Um, and of course, finally, just in case anyone need any more persuading that this text is perhaps the most fabulous text ever written. Um, there are also, there is also an entire chapter on Ruhani or uh, what we might more familiarly call Yogini or Shaktis. Um, these female uh, local deities or uh, female spirits that um, are described and illustrated in great detail. And there's uh, over 180 of them. Um, that are described and depicted in these uh, quite fascinating ways. That's, that's not part of the book, I just put it in there because I find this picture particularly fascinating and maybe I'll work on it next. And with that, I will stop talking. Okay, so now uh, Helen. You're muted, Helen. One second. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Emma, for this really fascinating presentation. And of course, the book is is really full, uh, full of interesting points and ideas. And you know, it's it's a book that you have to really consider numerous times and read many times in order to really understand it's uh, all the all the all the issues that uh, you are discussing. What I wanted to ask you is, um, you you uh, there's a many pages that you devote to Mahmoud Gawan. And um, as I'm a Bachmani lady, I would love to know um, what you, you talk about language and how important 
um, it was the, 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 a Persianized language that uh, he tried to introduce um, to the elites, uh, if you want, of the king, and he tries to do that through his books, through his uh, correspondence, rather. What, uh, what I don't understand is that uh, already Persian, in many ways, uh, Arabic was the language of uh, prophecy, was the language of the Quran, was a highly respected, really, I mean, you know, sacred language. Persian, by the 15th century, had already, uh, in many ways, uh, adopted certain sacred elements because it was the language that was used by the Sufis. It was the language of poetry. It was the language also of the administration and the elites. Um, what, what would the Arabicized Persian have done or uh, added to, um, to, to, this, uh, to, this, uh, to this courtly environment uh, of the 15th century? Uh, wasn't by then, Persian equally important? So, yes. Um, what I think he's doing, uh, what I think the point of this is, is that, so I think there's several points. I think one is an attempt to position where he is as not the periphery, but also one of the centers of intellectual production, of intellectual thought. Um, he's not, He's not wishing to be seen. Memur Gavan has this highly erudite intellectual network um, that he, uh, he believes he is part of, he feels fully part of, and he doesn't want to be seen as a provincial vizier in some out of the way kingdom on the edges of the known world. He wants to um, describe, if you like, or, or portray the uh, the society in which he is employed as one that is part of this cosmopolitan world. That's what I think he's doing on one, on one level. So he's, he's partly a, a kind of a, an outward facing projection of his, um, his uh, an outward facing projection to, the, to, an, uh, to an, an audience beyond India, okay? Um, I think there's also a, a very local angle, which is that, as we know from Shirwani and all of the all of the chronicles that talk, and of course the chronicles that write about the Bahmanis are written much later anyway. But no. if we take them at face value, it is a time of factional strife. It is a time of ethnic strife, right? So one of the things he's trying to do is also to purge the Persian that is being used of local specific elements. And you you notice in particularly in the um, uh, in the um, Manazir uh, Al-Nsha, um, mm -hmm. the, the technical, the how to write manual, what he does is he spends all of this time saying, you know, people who write this way in this particular fashion, they're, pr they're, they're pronouncing it wrong. You shouldn't pronounce it like this ethnic group or that ethnic group. You should pronounce, the, you should, and he takes as his model, the proper, like standard, standard Persian, if you like, standardized English uh, or received pronunciation for him is an Arabicized Persian. It's not one that has a Turanian influence. It's not one that has a, um, a Gilani influence. You know, so there's, there's that kind of sense of an attempting to overcome this kind of uh, quite ethnically um, inflected factionalism that is happening right at the time that he's writing a lot of this stuff. So I think there's, it's happening at two levels. There's a, a response to the local environment and a response to the wider environment. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a, a, a final element, which is that he is also, and this is something I only worked out right at the very end, um, because I was, you know, as we all do in South Asia, I started off working in my own little silo. I didn't look sideways. And I only realized, actually reading Evrim's book, that actually Mahmoud Gavan is also part of this entire um, intellectual trend at the time yeah. of, of, of taking, of letterism, right? Of, of taking the letters seriously and their hidden meanings that are in those letters. And to me, that was something that realization dawned too late for it even to be made a, a, a very strong part of what I wrote. Um, but, but you mention it. You mention in your book that in fact, you 
yeah, I, I mentioned the fact also that I, I didn't get there until it was too late. Mm -hmm. But you know, mm -hmm. it's okay. Mm -hmm. The second edition can come out. <laughs> Thank you. Now, there are many more questions I would like to ask, but it's not, uh, I think, um, I think I should let Evrim uh, and, uh, and the others to ask other questions rather than me. We, I hope we'll be able to speak again soon. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. So I will go ahead with my response now. Um, and I want to apologize if a little bit of it is uh, repetitive, but I think it bears repeating in some ways. So in the past decades, the Deccan, as a region of study, has experienced a watershed. Pioneers such as George Michel, Philip Wagoner, Richard Eaton, Helen Filon, and Deborah Hutton have nurtured a generation, including Marika Sardar, Pushkar Sohni, and several others. Given this progress, how to move forward? Adding a much needed social dynamic to our understandings of the Indo-Islamic societies, this is the scholarly terrain into which Emma Flatt's book enters. Flat draws upon many of the same theoretical models, including courtliness and ethics explored by Dawood Ali in his seminal study, Courtly Culture and Political Life in Early Medieval India, 2004, to probe the flotsam of extant sources from the early modern Deccan. The first half of our book addresses courtly society by considering courtly dispositions, friendship, transregional networks, and mercantilism. And in the second half of her book, she focuses on skills and how the acquisition and practice of epistolary, esoteric, and martial skills molded courtly selves. With command over her materials, Flat weaves together an account of a world of courtiers and merchants practicing skills to live their lives ethically together. Because of the intercourt entanglements of various individuals and the porousness of frontiers, Flat does not tether her book to a single Deccan court. Yet it would be an understatement to say that this book significantly expands our understanding of the individual courts. It redefines our understanding of this interconnected world. This book is a rare work that historicizes 16th century court culture with its roots in the 15th century and 15th and earlier centuries. Through a number of normative texts and their relationship to historical episodes, Flat effectively develops the notion of a courtly disposition for early modern Indo-Islamic society. The body and soul were malleable through practice, riyazat, of skills. It could build one's perfect and build and perfect one's disposition. Ethical practice facilitated long distance transcultural movements and enabled the court to be what German sociologist Norbert, Norbert Elias called quote, a network of people. These practices not only pervaded the quote, court, but such codes enabled mercantile communities to thrive as well. Over the past decade, we have witnessed Flat's project steadily unfold through many landmark articles, and now it is a pleasure to have the coherent larger intervention in hand. Through a measured social history of the Deccan Sultanates, this book brings together a long lost world alive. The ethical life of individuals in this book adds a much needed nuance to the political histories of statehood and imperialism in the Indo-Islamic world. Like Dawood Ali's courtly culture, one hopes that this book will reshape the field and stand the test of time. This lucidly argued book invites little critique. By publishing her findings on the authorship and significance of the Najum al or Stars of the Sciences, many of images we've seen today from the Chester Beatty Library, Flat has brought this manuscript back to scholarly attention after Linda Leach and Deborah Hutton's publications. Now the manuscript merits a collaborative project with historians, art historians, and philologists. From the perspective of an art historian, I offer some further questions about this milestone text and manuscript. Is it sufficient to call the Najum an astrological encyclopedia when one su substantial cluster of manuscripts to understand this single work comes from the corpus of cosmographies? The Najum's remit was to codify, not necessarily personally prescribe, therefore, therefore further relegating it to the category of encyclopedia of which astro astrology was one subject. This was an encyclopedia explicitly intended for its time as flat sensitively reads, necessary medicine for the lives of the Sultan's close circle. The Najum el Alum is indeed an expansive text and perhaps subverts neat generic categorization. But flat reminds us how this was a more all encompassing as a uh, project, including sections on horses, elephants and arms and armor, including seven non extant chapters. 
why would encyclopedia rather than astrological encyclopedia not be more an apt category? I'm curious of the choice of focusing on the or singling out the astrological components um, and maybe it has something to do with the text title. So this is my one point uh, of, um, of discussion with you, Emma. Thank you so much for a wonderful book. Well, thank you. That, that's a great uh, comment. And touche. Yeah, you got me. <laughs> Why did I call it an astrological encyclopedia? Um, because because of the title of the book, which is, as we know, um, it is, it is, so there is no title page. Uh, there is the inscription on the front page, which, which refers to it as the um, Kitab Nudulum. Um, and that is, you know, supposedly it, it refers to, I haven't even got the inscription in my head right now, but it, it refers to how it, it is bought by somebody for the library of Ibrahim Ibn Shah II which you know confused people for many years um i have a theory that perhaps it is possible the book a theory only based on circumstantial evidence but that the book may well have been in chan bibi's possession when she went to ahmadnagar and may have somehow had to be repurchased back from ahmadnagar but that's only a theory that's not really based on anything um apart from the fact that chan bibi was ali adil shah's wife and was in ghost bijapur and um but the title, um, so why do I call it an astrological encyclopedia? There, the moment at which um, uh, Ali Adil Shah claims his authorship, which is in the description of Venus, refers to her, um, refers to her, him as the writer of this, uh, the writer of this text, who is known as Ali Adil Shah, who was born, uh, and that she is born in the territory that is under his control. And the image of Ali Ad, of Venus in the description of Venus explains to us that she is holding um, a kitab, um, kitab in Najum. So she's also holding a book of stars. So for me, those three coincidences, the, the, the title at the beginning, this connection with Venus and the fact that Venus is holding a book of stars, to me, seem to underline the, the preeminence given to astrology. But you're right entirely. It, it talks about many, many other things. Um, there are 51 chapters in total. There are only 11 extant chapters. Um, uh, it could easily be called merely an encyclopedia. Um, there is a there is a prominence given to the cosmos for sure, um, and for me at the time when I first started working on it, I hadn't really worked out the difference between the stars and the cosmos, if you like. You know, the 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 idea that I hadn't really thought about the nuances, and I just called it what I what I thought best described it. I've started calling it a compendium, actually because I'm not even sure that encyclopedia is the right word. Um, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's not an encyclopedia in the sense that it doesn't explain anything. It just brings together different, important, powerful and effective tools. So nowadays, I, when I refer to it, I refer to it as a compendium of powerful and effective tools um, because every single thing that I have read within that book is aimed at giving you knowledge in order to do something to, to increase your power. So these, these are tools, even if it doesn't always tell you explicitly how to use them. Um, and I think an encyclopedia might be um, a little bit too European in the baggage that it carries. Um, if somebody has asked a question on the side, I'm, I'm, I'm not very good at multitasking in case you haven't noticed, um, but somebody asked a question about the continuity uh, between the Man of Salasa and uh, the conceptual world of Delhi Sultanates. And yes, absolutely, there, there's, there really is a continuity. And, um, you know, here we're all bound by our own ideas. I don't speak Sanskrit um, or read Sanskrit, um, one day maybe. Um, but I would love to study the two together or, or to do a collaborative project in which you could study those two together because that you know particularly now that we know everything we know about the fascination that Bijapur had for the Chalukyas um, and the Manasalasa being a Chalukyan text there is a you know there is a real possibility that this is part of this kind of wider affiliation with this earlier um, this earlier text or, 
that that um, you know was so important for the in the Jalukya kingdom. Having said that, though, this is there is also um, it's also quite clear that from the bits that I've looked at and have checked with people who do know the Manasalasa, it's not a direct translation. So it's informed by some of the ways of thinking and the ways of envisaging the world in the Manasalasa, perhaps informed by the project per se, but it's not a direct translation of the Manasalasa. It is a, a compilation of many, many different sources that are brought together, including some older ones, uh, the um, Narapati Jayacharya. There's all sorts of various exciting things inside. Uh, many things that I haven't yet identified. Um, and I absolutely, 100% second your idea of a collaborative project. It needs a team of historians of all stripes working on it. Yeah, I, um, the one thing that I would say is that um, just thinking about your response to Helen's uh, recent question um, and also the work of Evrim, is that astrology is almost part of the everyday. It's, 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 it's everywhere. So it's, it's almost, it, by calling, it's, it's part of an encyclopedic knowledge that it almost, um, calling it an astrological encyclopedia is in one way or a compendium, in one way um, even redundant because it's, it's part of, you know, in, in this period and in this time and place, um, astrology and these sort of more spiritual esoteric sciences is part of um, what we might consider encyclopedic now. So, um, so now I will turn it to Professor Binbas um, for his comments. Um. Um, thank you very much and thank you all for, uh, for um, coming today or attending to our uh, program today and um, first I would like to thank um, Helen Filon and Deccan Heritage Foundation for organizing uh, this wonderful webinar series and, and also for including me uh, today. Um, and I also, I'm very grateful um, to um, Her Highness of Missouri today, and again, um, being part of this, for being part of this event. Um, as Helen mentioned before, um, I'm not an entirely insider, if I may use the term. Uh, I come from the sort of Central Asian and Iranian world. Uh, but, um, uh, but I had the great opportunity of visiting the Deccan, I should say, in 2018. And I, again, I'm grateful to Helen and the Deccan Heritage Foundation for that. Uh, and, and I should say that that visit had a tremendous impact on my, um, on the physical and cultural, cultural geography that I had uh, in my mind. Um, I had been aware of the importance of the Deccan, uh, mainly through the work of, uh, the work of um, Jean Aubin, the amazing French scholar, uh, but visiting cities like Hyderabad and Bidar and sites like Golconda make made knowing more about the Deccan and, uh, and intellectual and methodological emergency, at least for me. Um, I feel lucky, I should say, in this regard, uh, because just as I feel this emergency, a number of excellent books on the Deccan have been published, including Emma's book. Uh, and this is just wonderful. But first, I would like to locate Emma's work in another context you know, beyond, beyond, uh, uh, beyond the Deccan. Um, I believe historical studies have been going through a silent revolution in recent de decades. Um, one of the most important characteristics of this silent revolution, if I may call it, is that the disciplinary boundaries have been increasingly blurred. Um, and one of, the, one of the results of this transformation is that the topics, regions, or subjects, which were as well considered marginal, um, have moved to the center of analysis. Uh, you know, one example is already mentioned, 10, 15 years ago, occult sciences or astrology was a niche subject in, in intellectual studies. Nowadays, it is, you know, if it is everywhere. We know that, you know, um, we have to know more about occult sciences. And again, this, is, this change had an impact on, our, on the geography in our mind. As, an, as, an, as a sort of Central Asianist and Iranist, the Deccan was on the borders of my geographical 
imagination, but nowadays I have to know more about the Deccan to be able to understand my own, uh, own subject. So this is a sort of a very interesting moment in historical studies that Emmasberg actually achieves this, um, achieves this task of combining different topics and regions wonderfully. Um, so the book successfully weaves through different topics from occult sciences to martial arts and from epistolary practices to early modern mercantilism and locates the Deccan in the Persianate Persian world or Persianate metropolis, as Emma calls it, which stretches from Bidar in the Deccan to Bursa in Anatolia uh, in one of her chapters. And I actually, just one footnote, I would like to thank her for uh, for using the word Persian accurately in her book, because nowadays in Iranian studies, the, the, the term Persian has been abused infinitely. It's just used in the sense that Persian outside um, Iran, you no, know, Persian means a sort of cultural and ethical framework. It doesn't, it has only tangen tangentially related to the language of Persian. So it's a cultural and political um, uh, category. Now, one of the features of this Persian, Persian cosmopolis or Persian world uh, was a holistic approach to body, soul, and nature, as I might explain just a few minutes ago. Individuals aimed at harmonizing these three elements, and the more they were successful in this harmonizing process, the more they became part of an interregional and multilingual community. So, uh, following Emma's analysis, the end of the underlying mechanism that constitute, constituted the Persian cosmopolis was ethics. So I would like to formulate my first question around this proposition. So this idea, of course, goes back to ancient Greek philosophy and um, to Aristotle, to be precise. Um, uh, and then later it was accepted by Muslim philo philosophers, uh, most prominently uh, Ibn Sina or Avicenna. So when Aristotle and Avicenna formulated their respective ideas on ethics, they both imagined it as part of a broader category of practical sciences. And this category had two other components, these are economics and politics. Um, so in other words, in this philosophical framework, the participation in politics and the good conduct in politics is intimately related and integral to ethical behavior. Politics, politics was conceived of as an ethical enterprise concerned with creating good and virtuous agents who would collaborate through politics and friendship to create a happy and just um, human association. The just part comes from Persian uh, political ideas, but that's not that uh, relevant for the time being. So this brings me to the elephant in the room kings, uh, because in the late medieval and early modern periods, uh, politics was intricately related to the ideas of kingship. But Emma makes an argument in her book and says that the earliest Orientalist scholarship reduced the study of South Asian history or in general, Middle Eastern or Asian history to the study of kingship. And I have no objection to this, of course, that is correct. Uh, but I wonder if by excluding kings, we are not also, we are also excluding the elephant in the room, that is politics. What was the role of politics and what was its nature in the Deccan society? So when Norbert Elias, you both referred to, when Norbert Elias published his famous work on manners, uh, manners and court etiquette, he was formulating his ideas on the background of a fundamental political transformation. That is the emergence of the absolutist state and in the early modern period. And in brief, as the absolutist states emerged, a new courtly society accompanied it, and etiquette and manners gained importance in the regulation of hierarchies among individuals and later institutions. So that was a civilizing process, as he called it. So politics, made us all better individuals. So I am trying to figure out what the broader canvas or framework was in the Deccan 
in the Declan context. So Emma actually gives us a glimpse of this transformation in her discussion on Adil Shah's Nujum al -Ulum. So in the text, it's a fast, one of the fascinating aspects of the book or sections in the book, I should say. Uh, in the text, Adil Shah imagines himself as a culmination of cos cosmic forces within a particular geography, that is Bijapur Sultanate. So I believe this is one of the best descriptions of what Hutchinson calls regional empire or universalism in a particular geography. Whereas Mahmoud Gawan in, in the previous century, Mahmoud Gawan tried to conceive an ethical and philosophical happiness uh, in an interregional Persian, Persian cosmopolis. Adil Shah tried to achieve the, achieve the same happiness uh, in a regional context without cutting ties with the Persian cosmopolis. So the, the, the dynamics is, is very neat and very interesting to me. So it is interesting that the Deccan Sultanates achieved this without eliminating the role that the Persian language played in that context. I'm mean, just for the sake of comparison, I will say that the Ottomans on the other end of the Persian cosmopolis took a different path in the same period and the same historical junction and dropped Persian, though they didn't entirely severe their ties with the Persianate, uh, Persianate uh, world. So before I come to the conclusion of my comments, um, I would like to emphasize another point which is kind of re related to my overall question. And that is, the, uh, that is this merc mercantilist disposition as um, Emma um, calls it. I find this point quite fascinating, not only because it demonstrates that the Deccan political elite tried to achieve an ideal individual and society by combining politics, economics, and ethics, three pillars of Aristotelian practical philosophy. So in the post-Mongol period after the 13th century, um, it was very normal to see political figures involved in trade. We call them Ortok in Mongolian, Mongolian or Ortak in, uh, in Turkish. But later in the 16th century, both in the Safavid Empire and the, and the Ottoman Empire, the political elites distanced themselves from the, from, the, from the trade. So in the Safavid context, the Armenian merchants emerged as the main mediators. And um, in the Ottoman Empire, again, the Jews, Armenians, and, and Greeks. Um, so I wonder if you observe a similar trend in the Deccan as well in sort of in this period or, or in, in, the, in the later period, to what extent the politics, economics, and ethics remain connected in, in the Deccan um, uh, context. So I will um, finish my presentation by congratulating Emma on this fascinating contribution to our field. Um, and I believe it's a dispensable study for understanding the contours of Persian societies um, everywhere. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ibrahim, for those uh, fascinating, interesting comments um, and for the compliments too. Um, kingship, okay. Uh, so in some ways, yes, it was a polemical move to dethrone the king, if you like. Uh, Partly, uh, you know, out of tiredness of the focus on um, Akbar and Jahangir and Shah Jahan and so on and so on. Um, which, you know, at the time, and you know, the thing that, <laughs> I, I, I'm a very slow writer, so I started writing this in 2004. Now we're in 2020. I start, you know, there's a whole 15 years of stuff has happened since I started writing and mobile field has changed immeasurably since I started too. Um, but so there was, you know, it, it is kind of polemical at an attempt to kind of get away from kings. But if you notice, as you have noticed, I don't actually get away from kings because I spend the vast majority of my time talking about Ali Adil Shah. Um, so at least in, in my own uh, understanding of what I've done, Ali Adil Shah does loom very large. So yes, you can't dethrone the king entirely. But what I wanted to do was to try and incorporate 
to 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 move the picture, move the the lens outwards, or whatever the whatever the expression is, like you know, like zoom out a bit. Let's get the court in there too, because at the end of the day, the king is not the sole motor of action, and the king himself is maybe the apex of the network, but he is also networked. He's also part of this. He's got to have these connections, otherwise he won't last very long as king. And in fact, we see that again and again in the Deccan of all the, these various different. Um, uh, you know, changes in affiliation, changes in, um, particularly in around the period of Ibrahim Adil Shah, after Ali, Ali Adil Shah, you see all of these different regions who are switching the, the, the um, uh, affiliation and the um, religion and the politics, if you like, of uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah's Bijapur, uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah II. So, Yes, absolutely. The king is there. It's it, he. He's he's crucial in the politics, but he's not the be all and end all of the politics. Um, what I was also trying to get across was that you know we have, I think, still a very narrow idea of what constitutes politics. That it has to be about state formation or about you know uh, administration. And what I was trying to do was and. Um, you know, I am the intellectual inheritor of my PhD supervisor. You know, I was trying to extend this idea that politics is also um, things that we nowadays would not consider politics. So letter writing is also politics. Well, that's not so controversial. Um, you know, the, the work that's being done on the new diplomatics um, um, uh, in uh, I've forgotten where it is in <laughs> in Belgium or somewhere. Uh, it, 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 Mayor Ravin is doing it and various other people like that are uh, doing amazing work on this new diplomatics. But um, the, um, uh, the, the idea that even making perfume is a political move, that you can manipulate the way people feel um, and, and, and that this idea that the intimate, the, the small actions, just by wearing a particular perfume and forcing other people to question the, the origin of your perfume can become a political act. If you wear the wrong type of person, perfume, you are no longer talking to the right kind of people. And what I was trying to get into this whole idea of politics is that the text, and, and partly it's also because of the archive we have, right? They, they, for the Deccan, we either have the chronicles, which are almost overweeningly important. You know, Firishta's narrative, drives us all. We all, you know, we're all basically repeating Firishta. And I wanted to get away from that idea that somehow that was all that was happening by looking at these texts which have been ignored because they don't seem to be relevant to anything important. And by saying these two are political. So I very much agree with you that uh, politics is an extremely important part of it. I think coming on to Ali Adil Shah in particular, I think what's going on and I, I like the way you put it, this idea, you know, the difference between Mehmet Govan's attempt to be uh, part of the, you know, cosmopolitan part of the Persian cosmopolis, whereas Ali Adil Shah is a rooted regional part of, you know, still cosmopolitan, but rooted and regional. And I think what's going on, and I think even at the time that I first discovered the way in which he makes his own... Um, he, he makes his own claim to authorship in that particular text. I didn't quite realize what he was doing. But what it, what is, it seems to me what's extremely important that's happening in uh, Bijapur, at least at that time, is an attempt to, to root the kingdom and kingship in not only the Indic cosmos, um, but also in the land of the Bijapur territory. There's a very, very strong... Um, determination to link Ali Adil Shah to sacred sites and that's why and you know I, 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 I didn't work on the yoginis because I didn't know what to do with it it was over and beyond my capabilities and I couldn't fit it into what I was doing with this earlier project but I think what needs to be done now is to work out what 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 are these these uh, 180 odd yoginis doing in this text where are they? What, what are their geographical locations? Because I have a, a, a very strong sense that what's going on is there's a, basically a, um, a kind of geography being laid out that of the places that I believe Adil Shah is kind of laying claim to. And there are certain places he's laying explicit claim to, but by placing these particular um, yoginis in this wider world 
um, of this, this compendium, whatever we ought to call this cosmic compendium, cosmo cosmological compendium he's come up with, he's also laying claim to the, the, the powers that come from the zemin, as they are called, the, the, um, which Linda Leach translates as earth forces, which, you know, sounds a bit new agey, but it'll do. Um, he locates his own uh, rulership in a sacred mountain where um, Venus is supposed to be born. He again locates it on the banks of the Krishna River. So there are all of these, these moments in which he's locating uh, his kingdom and his kingship in a, in a real and cosmological geography. And I think there's something really, really fascinating going on there. That, I think that, that section is fascinating. Sort of move over to that. And, um, and, and I would say that it's also rather interesting, and, and you've made this connection before, is this connection between cos, cosmopolitanism that's going on in this period and the cosmos that is being mapped in the Nijimalum. And, and that, you know, and, and amongst, you know, picking up on that, Vivek, you know, like, when I wrote this, uh, my thesis, there were a lot of people I spoke to who said, get rid of the term cosmopolitan, it's gone, it's a has-been, you know, that, that ship has sailed and cosmopolitanism is no longer in fashion, you don't need to do this. And I retained it precisely because of the importance of the cosmos, because cosmopolitanism the, the whole point of cosmopolitanism is, is it, it's like the city of the cosmos of, and, and cosmos in cosmopolitanism is the bit that we need to work on. That actually what's going on here is an, an, an attempt to establish and at least in the Najum to make equal one cosmos with another cosmos and bring, to get, bring them together into this greater cosmology or something. Um, and I think that that cosmos bit of it is crucially important. And that's why I stuck with the term, even though a lot of people I know don't like the term. Um, you know, they see it as too derivative of Sheldon Pollock's, um, you know, article and so on. So for me, it, it has that utility of drawing attention to the importance of the cosmos in uh, ways of understanding power at the time. Yeah, so um, thank you, Avrim, for your wonderful um, response. Um, now we have time for um, a few questions from the chat box. Um, and um, I'll just start with um, one of them um, submitted by um, Anirudh Kanuseti um, that asks about um, whether or not we have texts that illuminate the connection between Vidyanagar and, um, and, 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 and I guess, Deccan court cultures. Um, so, uh, Emma, this is a, one, a question that we're all thinking about, but maybe you would like to talk a little bit about it. Yeah, let me just, I'm trying to find the question on the side. I've lost it now. Um, okay, so do we have texts that illuminate uh, the interaction between the Deccan Sultanates and Vijayanagar? Is that the question? Yes, yes. Um, so, um, <laughs> We have, we have texts that do it in oblique ways. We have um, texts, so for example, chronicles, which talk of people moving back and forth. We have objects, we have architecture, um, uh, things that like uh, Philip Wagner has worked on of the various different, um, uh, you know, uh, buildings that were built by particular people, um, Ahmed Khan's mosque, for example, the Dharam um, or so we have those kind of things. Um, the extent to which the texts I look at illuminate the connection with Vijayanagar is less than I hoped it would, in a certain sense. I hoped it would be very clear and obvious that, you know, they were talking to each other. It, it's obvious that they were drawing from Indic knowledge systems that were circulating in the region. To what extent they were sharing texts with uh, the Vijayanagar Empire, I don't have definite proof. Um, I, as I've said, I don't read Sanskrit or Kannada or Telugu for that matter. Um, so, but my sense is that there's an awful lot of that is going on that 
we miss because of our linguistic limitations, which is to say that the people who know the Persian text well enough don't, are not able to access the Telugu, Kannada and Sanskrit texts adequately to, to, to see the resonances. Um, I think the people we're looking at were far more skilled in, um, in both cultures than many of our scholars are. That's changing. The new generation of PhD students are, um, you know, they're going to <laughs> replace us all very soon um, with all of their massive skills. But what, what, what it seems to me is, for example, um, if you look at uh, Mehmud Gavan's uh, mercantilist kind of language in his Incha texts, and you look at some of the stuff that's being written in Telugu that I can only access in translation at the same time, there is similarly a kind of mercantilist, uh, and in fact Sunil Sharma picks this up, um, there's this kind of idea of, uh, there is this kind of mercantile language that is also cre creeping into the Telugu. There's also this kind of, um, uh, this, uh, how do you describe it? This, this, this attempt in some of the Telugu at a little bit earlier than um, Memu Gavan is writing to purge, uh, to write a Telugu that is purged of Sanskrit. Um, and then there's an, at, at the same time, there suddenly comes along this one particular poet who writes a very Sanskritized Telugu, which to me is, and he's only about 50 years before Memu Gavan is writing. To me, that seemed like a really fascinating analogy that's going on, that you, you know, in this Telugu trend of purging out the Sanskrit, you suddenly have this one particular poet, I believe it's Srinata, who comes back and writes a very, very highly Sanskritized Telugu poem. Um, and he's also, I believe, um, connected to, um, you know, he, he, he's also connected to kind of letter writing. I don't want to call him a munshi, but he, he's, you know, in, in this particular instance. So you've got this really fascinating thing and uh, Narayana Rao suggests that perhaps there may be some influence with what's going on at Persian at the same time. So there are, there are definitely things that are going on. They, they, there it are clearly texts that, um, that will illuminate it further, but we still have to look for these connections. And one of the things um, I was, uh, watching um, Professor Eaton's talk um, uh, that he gave in the Deccan Heritage uh, series um, a few days ago. And one of the questions to him was, well, does any of this, does any of the Indian stuff go outwards to Iran and to the, to the, the rest of the Persian cosmopolis? And, you know, it's, a, it's an easy question to say, well, um, you know, maybe that the vast majority seems to be coming in and not going out. But we also have to remember that, you know, there too, there's a huge historiographical block that f for many years, people working in Iran and uh, Central Asia have not even thought to look to India for influences. So it's because, it, why would they? It, that Iran is the center of the Persian world. Why would they look for influences from outside, right? So there's, you know, like until we start looking for things, we're not gonna find them. So uh, that's a really long rambling answer. Vivek, you wanna help me here? Yeah, yeah I, just, I just wanna say that um, I think that's a great answer and it's, it's wonderful that you um, picked up on that uh, bit from, um, uh, from Richard Eaton's talk because I, I couldn't agree with you more and I, I think it has a lot to do with also the language that we use this these terms of the Persian and the Persianate that sort of uh, cr create Iran as a center um, and and so um, because a lot during the early modern period at least um, India is very much a contender for the center of this world, um, given, given its production of texts and, and culture and so on and so forth. Um, I am looking at the time right now and it's 15 minutes past, so um, I do apologize to some of our question answer, uh, que uh, questioners, but, um, but we will have to close the session now. So please join me in, um, in thanking Dr. Emma Flatt for her wonderful book, and um, and uh, Dr. Avram Bimbas and um, Helen Filon for all of this work. So thank you, Emma. Um, and um, this is just a reminder uh, for this for this really wonderful book um, uh, published by Cambridge University Press. Um, and I just want to remind that our next um, our next uh, event is on January twenty second. Um, Anna Seastrand from the University of Minnesota will be giving a talk, Image and Imagination, 
wall paintings in early modern South India. And then we will also have, we'll be taking a break, a fast during the month of February. Um, and we will come in with the, to the new year uh, with um, Professor M Evren Bimbas, um, who you met today with a, uh, on March 5th, um, with a talk um, entitled, The Idea of Sacral Kinship Between Islamic and Turkle Mongol Concepts of Politics, which really nicely complements what he is, his comments he made today um, in response to ethics. Um, so um, thank you so much for joining us and, and that's all for today. Uh, thank you.